Okay, Revelation. Revelation chapter 17. I'll begin reading at verse 1, Revelation 17, and I'll read to verse 6, and we'll get into our study. Revelation beginning at verse 1 in chapter 17. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bulls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads, ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Now, as we've already seen, as we've been going through the book of Revelation, not all the events recorded in Revelation are in what would be called chronological order. The events uh, found here in this chapter, in chapter 17, obviously occur chronologically prior to what are called the bold judgments. So what we have in this passage is an introduction to Mystery Babylon. Mystery Babylon is referred to as being the tool of the Antichrist. In the context of Babylon here in this passage, Babylon is used as a picture of man's kingdoms on earth. In other words, Babylon is more than simply speaking of a particular city in Iraq. It can also speak of something beyond just the identification of the name Babylon. For example, when we speak of Hollywood, uh, we don't really refer to Hollywood simply as a city. When we speak about it, you know, that guy's gone Hollywood or they have Hollywood values. We're not speaking simply of a city. We are speaking of a movie industry. If we speak of Wall Street, we're, we're speaking really of commerce or the stock market. If we spoke about somebody who's um, involved in Madison Avenue, we're, we're speaking of advertising. So there are times that you will use the name of a city or a location uh, as a generalization. And in, in some ways, uh, we can be looking at Babylon in that way. When you speak of Detroit, Detroit once, some of you are old enough to remember this, when you use the name Detroit, you were speaking of the auto industry. And somebody spoke of Detroit, they were speaking of the auto industry. When you say Chino, you're thinking of flies. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's what it represents. Well, Mystery Babylon speaks of a system that will dominate the world during the tribulation. Uh, what it is, and we'll see this in chapters 17 and 18, uh, it, it is uh, the economic, the political, and the religious system that is established by Antichrist. Chapter 17 is going to refer to the religious aspect of Mystery Babylon, and chapter 18 will speak of its commercial quality. And so tonight, obviously, in chapter 17, we'll be looking at uh, the religious aspect of this system called Mystery Babylon, because chapter 17 is going to reveal something. Chapter 17 is going to reveal God's judgment on apostate religion. And we'll look at that in some detail in just a moment. During this time, Antichrist has allowed religion to continue as long as it suits his purpose. But now, chapter 17 gives to us a picture of God judging a false religious system. Now, in verses 1 and 2, again, it says, One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, many waters obviously representing many peoples, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, 
and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Well, what we have now is John being invited to see the judgment that God brings on false religion. And, and this false religious system is referred to, and notice it's referred to as the judgment of the great harlot, this great harlot who sits on many waters. So that would refer to the incredible influence Mystery Babylon has had on the world. Her influence, in other words, is not simply uh, during the tribulation, but this is an influence of Mystery Babylon that you actually can tra trace back uh, much before the tribulation. It's actually this influence that is coming to its culmination during the tribulation has actually been present throughout pretty much the history of man. The influence of Mystery Babylon. The influence of Mystery Babylon has already invaded all the nations of the world. Even as I am seated here in this room speaking to you about uh, Revelation 17, we know that even at this moment, the influence of Mystery Babylon has influenced and invaded all the nations of the world. It's a worldwide deception. And, and the heart of Mystery Babylon and this Mystery Babylonish uh, religious system is a denial of the truth of Scripture and in... Uh, and is revealed in a replacing of scriptural truth with the lie of Satan. Babylon has an ancient symbolism in scripture. Babylon is mentioned in Genesis chapter 11. And all the way back in the first book of the Bible, it is associated with rebellion and it is associated with confusion. And when you think of Babylon in Genesis 11, obviously, if, you, if you've read your Bible and read uh, that portion, you know you're, it's speaking of the Tower of Babel and the confusion that took place where God had confused the tongues, the languages of men because they had uh, decided that they would choose to follow um, the astrological signs of heaven rather than the uh, revelations of God. And so it's all the way back in Genesis 11, this, this mystery Babylon spirit it's already referred to very early in the age of man. It's an ancient uh, false worship. It's a spirit that has influenced religion throughout the ages, and it continues to have influence even during the tribulation. This influence of Mystery Babylon is something we experience now. Christianity is rapidly uh, losing its impact in the world and has rapidly lost its influence in the nations of the West. Great Britain is an example of that. When you look at the history of missions and all, you will see that in the history of Great Britain, Great Britain uh, in the 1800s especially, and even prior to that, but especially in the 1800s, produced some of the finest and most dedicated missionaries this world has ever seen. The Hudson Taylors and uh, Dr. Livingston's and, and some of the greatest preachers like Charles Spurgeon, uh, all of them were, were British preachers and missionaries. If you, if you spend some time looking even, uh, even a little bit at church history and, and look at the church and its life there in Great Britain, you'll see that it was once an incredibly powerful nation. But uh, I was reading that uh, there are about 63 million inhabitants of what is called the United Kingdom today, about 63 million. And it is estimated that out of the 63 million population that you may have uh, approximately one person was saying as, as little as one million evangelical Christians, evangelical. Now, I was thinking about that as I was preparing this today because I use terminology very often that I naturally assume is just it's a language that all of us use, but uh, perhaps you, you don't know what that word evangelical refers to, so let me define it for you when I speak of an evangelical Christian. An evangelical Christian is a person who's, uh, who is centered on the person of Jesus Christ. An evangelical Christian is obedient to the Great Commission. An evangelical Christian is committed to the gospel as set forth in the Bible. An evangelical Christian is one who uh, values a day-to-day -day personal life in Christ as well as witness for Jesus Christ. And an evangelical Christian is one who labors for the Lord because that evangelical Christian anticipates the return of Jesus Christ. And uh, in, in Great Britain, you have approximately 63 million 
uh, people living in the United Kingdom, and you have uh, around a million who would fall under the category of evangelical believers in Christ, which leaves, quite obviously, 62 million who do not have a relationship with God. The nation that at one time sent missionaries throughout the world to proclaim the gospel, who boasts some of the greatest preachers who have ever graced a pulpit to where it is today. So the, the church is rapidly losing influence throughout the world. When you go into Great Britain, when you go into, for example, I've been into, into England, and, and when you're in London, many of the churches that at one time were filled to over, overflow uh, are actually standing empty. Uh, some of those churches I've seen have been transformed into, into dance halls. Uh, they've been transformed into libraries or coffee shops, uh, restaurants. Some of them are simply landmarks today, and others have been uh, changed into mosques. And that's in, in Great Britain, in England, and that's in London and, and some of the cities surrounding. There are those in England today that are what are called neo-pagans. And uh, the neo-pagans are increasing. Uh, a neo-pagan is defined very often as an individual who practices Wicca or witchcraft. And, and even in England today, there are uh, people who are going back to the ancient uh, practice of Druidism. And that's there in England right now. There is a hyper-Pentecostal movement that has uh, been in England. And the problem is it's infected a lot of the churches, taking them away from the teaching of the Word of God and into extravagant displays of, of, of flesh. In, in Germany, uh, churches battle against the extremism of state-run churches and hyper-Pentecostalism. In, in Germany, you have liberal theology, uh, and you also have what would be called Holy Spirit extremism. There are various TV preachers in Germany that actually have had an incredibly negative impact on the gospel of Jesus Christ in Germany. And um, there was a time in Germany where on television, people were actually being warned against what they referred to as American cultural Christianity. So the Germans were being warned, don't believe these Christians who are coming out here from the United States because they're bringing a bunch of nonsense to you. Mystery Babylon. Mystery Babylon is waiting in the wings to be fully exposed even now. In the United States, there are a lot of American churches that have what we call feel-good theology. Verse-by-verse -verse studies are not the norm. The Bible is disrespected. Rebellion exists concerning biblical authority. I can, I can tell you that right now. I'll stop on that one point and, and say I can tell you that right now. I've had more than one discussion with people who, who will differ with what the Bible has to say and it's based on their feelings and their emotions. And, and if they don't feel good about it, then they're going to argue with you. Uh, there, are, there are signs and wonders that are exalted. There's a false love with no discernment. And that false love is confused with the fruit of the, of the Spirit. Grace has been twisted into permission to continue to sin. Just as last weekend when I was teaching in another church in another state, I was sharing about the wonderful, transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do we all agree that the gospel changes lives? I mean, I, I, was, I was simply, I was saying, you know what? The gospel of Jesus Christ changes lives. And I was just sharing a basic study, a very basic study, nothing deep and profound. I don't have the capacity for that. But I was giving a, a simple study. God's word is true. And when you have God's word and God's spirit working in a human life, transformation happens. And what you were at one time is what you were but are no longer. Basic, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Very basic. And by way of illustration, I shared how my sister Rebecca had lived in the homosexual lifestyle for many years. Just shared a general kind of how powerful God's transforming power is. She serves the Lord now. And it was a praise report to the body of Christ. How God forgives you of every sin. But you need to repent. 
and turn to him. And when you do, he transforms you. Very simple Bible teaching. And a lady came up afterwards and wanted to chew me up. She didn't get to me. She got to the pastor of the church. But she says, I want to talk to you and him. She has four children and is a lesbian and doesn't want to come to a church that has no tolerance and you're preaching hate and I don't want my children in a church like this. This is the first time we've ever come and it's the last time we'll ever be here. And so when the pastor begins to speak to her and says, but the word of God teaches that that lifestyle is sin, turns to the scriptures and reads the passage and says, this is what it says. She says, I was raised a Baptist. I know what the Bible says. And she said this to him. She said, it's a sin like any other sin, and God is merciful, and he forgives sins. And so her whole argument is, I can remain in sin because God is merciful. With no understanding of why Jesus died on that cross in the first place. Listen, if, if you could go to heaven with just a few sins, Jesus died in vain. Jesus died to set you free from the bondage of sin and anticipated that when he saved you, that you would understand that means that you're now born again and your life is transformed by the wonderful grace of God. But because we live in a time where grace is looked at now as permission to continue in sin, you can go to church and hear a message that's just Bible and get so angry because it just doesn't agree with your opinion on life and God. Mystery Babylon. It's called the great harlot. As a harlot, she has seduced multitudes. But she's revealed as having no relationship to God, but is in reality an apostate. She is more than likely what we would call today an eclectic religious system. I have a a slide I want to show you very briefly. You guys seen this? Mystery Babylon. That's what I'm talking about. It's right there. You've got all these various symbols. You know, uh, Islam, pacifism, that E stands for homosexual rights, Judaism, uh, paganism is the I, uh, Buddhism, Taoism, and Christianity. And what you, what you have is you have that mentality. Listen, if you don't think it's here, it's here. It's here right now. You've seen that bumper sticker. It's all over. Let's just get along. The great philosopher, Paul McCartney, <laughs> one of the Beatles, said this. He said, I pick bits out of all the religions. So I like many things that Buddhists say. I like a lot of things that Jesus said, that Muhammad said, Paul McCartney. That's a mentality that is out there today. The New Testament contains warnings concerning this, the time that we're living in. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, the Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3. There were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories they have made up. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them. Their destruction has not been sleepy. We are warned in Scripture about this mystery Babylon spirit. When Jesus is asked, what is the sign of your coming and the end of all things? The first thing he says, remember, I've quoted this to you, Matthew chapter 24. Take heed that you are not deceived. That's the sign of the last days, and that's what we're living in right now. And so we're looking at this 
mystery, this great harlot that is being described here in verses 1 and 2. In verse 3, it says, He, he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And so she is, she is uh, revealed uh, as, as sitting on, notice, a scarlet beast. Chapter 12 of Revelation, verse 3, uh, we use that to describe Satan himself. So this is uh, Satan's religion. In a wilderness, when it's referred to, when wilderness, he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. The word wilderness is a picture of a, a lifeless religion. It, it's dry. It has no, no living water. My people have committed two errors. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they have hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. God refers to himself in the book of Jeremiah as the fountain of living water. Jesus said, come unto me and drink. And even as the scripture says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. He told the woman uh, at the well, the woman of Samaria, if you drink this water, you will thirst again. But if you drink of the water that I give to you, you will never thirst again. False religion, listen carefully, false religion always leaves you thirsty, wanting something else. That's what false religion does. And so that's what is being described here. In verse 4, her apparel is purple, scarlet, etc. Purple, throughout Scripture, is uh, a picture of royalty. Scarlet is a picture of redemption. The gold and precious stones refers to false blessings. The golden cup filled with intoxicating drink is speaking of a false spirit. She gives her followers wine, in other words, because it dulls their senses, excites their passions, and renders them unable to discern truth from error. Have you ever witnessed to somebody who's drunk? Have you? How many of you have? Out of curiosity, I have. I've been drunk, and someone's witnessed to me. And, and it's, just, you're just, it's just kind of like stupid conversation, because there's, there's no communication taking place. And so the enemy, that's, that's a picture of what she does. She intoxicates you. So it's senseless and it's dull. It makes no sense. Her religious system is that way. But she's described here as a seductress. So she's causing people to get drunk. But as she does so, she's actually robbing them. She's robbing them. It says in verse 5, on her forehead, a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and the abominations of the earth. So when it speaks in that way on her forehead, outwardly, she is beautiful. And I, I shared this with you before, and you'll see something in just a moment. Um, there is what is called a beautiful side of evil. It, it, and, and I like that term. It's a, it's, a, it's a very rich term, the beautiful side of evil. The enemy never reveals himself to you in all his hideousness. He will always disguise himself as an angel of light. So there's a beautiful picture of evil. There are a lot of people who think that evil has a beauty to it because the enemy disguises the evil but doesn't give to you a full picture. So the commercials on TV show this, this person with a six-pack drinking beer when in reality his belly is a case or a keg. Or, or, or you're always so sophisticated smoking that cigarette, aren't you? You're just so cool, so cool. Blowing smoke rings. You know, oh, man, look at me, you know. But they don't show you 40 years later with the, a hole in your throat so you can breathe. They don't show you that way. They don't show you with diseases and, and getting, uh, you know, amputations sometimes that are actually direct causes of nicotine addiction. They, they don't tell you how much money you're going to spend over the next 30 years on cigarettes. 
when I smoked, and I did smoke for a few years, when I smoked, cigarettes at that time were 25 cents a pack. I don't know what they are now, but I know they're not 25 cents a pack. And so if anybody here knows how much they are, start multiplying a pack a day, multiply that over 30 years, and you get an idea of what I'm trying to say. It's just an amazing amount of money that is spent on something that is day by day killing you, day by day killing you and killing others around you. It's a fact. But it's never presented that way, is it? Because when you see it in movies, it's always cool. You know, fornication? Oh, no, that's just making love. Or that's just in you know, sowing wild oats. It's going to be OK. But they don't show you AIDS. They don't show you herpes. They don't, they don't show you the results of these. They don't. They don't show you. The, 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 the syphilis and venereal warts and the variety of things that, that occur when you're just casually having sex and the, and the multitude of abortions, the children that have been, been, been put to death in mama's wombs out of convenience, they, they don't show you that. You're, you're not going to be told that. You're not, you're not going to, that's not going to be told to you. That's really not. It's not. There's a beautiful side to evil. Don't forget it. Don't forget it. Seduction. Seduction is telling somebody something that they know that person wants to hear in order to get something that they want from them. That's seduction. And Mystery Babylon is seduction. And people are following this particular spirit. Now, when it's referred to as mystery, that would speak of it being a magic religion. It's a cultic. It, it could include things like uh, trying to speak to the dead. That's necromancy or soothsaying, even astrology. Babylon, when you see Babylon, again, that harkens back to uh, the city that was founded by Nimrod in the, in the book of Genesis. Now, in verse 6, notice this. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Now, notice, when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. That's what I'm talking about when I say evil has, it can have a, an effect even on strong believers. John is dazzled by her, even though she's being revealed as a savage beast that destroys Christians. I was watching a history special a few days ago, and it just so happened that it was a special related to the early church. And uh, the commentator was speaking concerning Caesar Nero, how that Nero instituted the first persecution against the church, and how that Nero had a hatred for Christians, a hatred. It's historically a fact. This was not a Christian program. This was on the Discovery Channel. So you can't say that they had a bias of any sort. They're just reporting the facts. And he said, Nero, this guy who was speaking, said, Nero hated Christians so much that he would actually stand and watch them as they were beaten to death. He would stand with pleasure. And they had an enactment where a woman, because a lot of women were beaten to death and martyred uh, in the early church, and this woman's hands are tied over her, her head. Well, some uh, Roman, uh, they called them the, the lictor, L-I-C-T-O-R. They had a, 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 a cane, and they beat her until you died. And the blood is splattering all over, and Nero's just smiling. And that's a historical fact. I mean, that actually happened. And from the time of Nero, even prior to that, with Stephen, the first martyr, there were persecutions unto the death. And historically, that has happened. And, and John is seeing this, and yet, as he sees this, this one who is drunk uh, with the blood of the martyrs, basically, um, when he sees her, he says in verse 6, I marveled with great amazement. But notice verse 7, the angel said to me, why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. He receives a rebuke. Again, apostate religion has a beauty and a seductiveness to it. And now it's explained, verse 8. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life. 
from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. When he comes, he must continue a short time. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war with the lamb, and the lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. He said to me, the waters which you saw which the harlot sits, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. The ten horns, which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh, burn her with fire. For God has put it into the hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind, and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. So a beast is pictured here. He ascends out of the bottomless pit. He is the counterfeit Messiah. And notice how it says he was, then he was not, then he ascends. Well, if we remember Revelation 9, that revealed Satan as ascending out of the pit. And so the beast is of satanic origin. And as chapter 13 revealed, Satan gives him his throne and his power. The result is going to be that the world will marvel and follow after the Antichrist. Now, in verse 8, when it speaks of the ungodly, uh, that, those, those are the ones, the ungodly are the ones whose names are not written in the book of life. Uh, those whose names are written in the book of life are believers. He, notice in verse 8, he mentions their names being written from the foundation of the world. So it would seem that these names are not written down during the course of history, but prior to creation, and it may imply that these names are not erased. Now in verse 9, when he says, here is the mind which has wisdom, he speaks of seven heads that are seven mountains, these mountains representing seven successive kings and their kingdoms. Mountains are commonly used in Scripture to represent kingdoms, authority, as well as an empire. In Jeremiah 51.25, as an example, it reads, I am against you, O destroying mountain. When he said, O destroying mountain, he was speaking of Babylon. You who destroy the whole earth, declares the Lord, I will stretch out my hand against you, roll you off the cliffs, and make you a burned out mountain. So mountain very often re represents kingdoms. He speaks in verse 10 of seven kings. And when he speaks of that, he's speaking of a succession of kingdoms. Now, when you look into history, we know that there have already been five great empires that have not only existed, but they ceased to exist. You have the Egyptian, the Assyrian, the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, as well as the Grecian. Those are empires that have already existed. The one that he speaks of that is would be the world government that existed during his day. And the world government that existed during the day of John is Rome. He speaks of an empire that is yet to come. That would be the Antichrist empire. Now, this empire, the seventh, will not last long, not compared to the other empires. But what will happen is there will be a ten-nation confederacy that, it, that is developed. Out of this confederacy will come the one who's going to be the leader. The leader of that confederacy will be Antichrist. He himself, according to verse 11, will be the eighth empire. Is it possible that a world ruler can actually come into existence today? And we all answer that by saying, yeah, yeah, it's very possible. You already see the uh, European Union. You already see, um, you know, euro dollars. You go into, into um, you know, various places throughout the Western Europe, and you, you use what is, is called the euro dollar. It's a European uh, um, uh, money system. That's already in existence. There's already 
a union that is established. It doesn't have 10 nations at the moment. It has more than 10. But eventually what you'll have uh, occur is going to be the reduction until it's got a 10-nation confederacy. And out of that 10-nation confederacy, you're going to end up with somebody who's going to be a leader over it. And that's basically what the Bible says. That's what it says. There's going to be a, a, a vacuum that needs to be filled by a leader, and the Antichrist is the one that will fill that void. And he himself, according to verse 11, is going to be the, the eighth empire. Now, in verse 12, it says, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings. These, these ten nations, again, are not in existence during John's time. These are end-time empires. And what they're going to do is they're going to turn the power over to the Antichrist, and he will somehow affect three of the kings. They will, according to verses 13 and 14, they will go to war against the Lamb. Imagine that for a moment. They'll go to war against the Lamb. The Lamb is a lion. And like C.S. Lewis pointed out, I believe it was C.S. Lewis, uh, Aslan is not a tame lion. Um, the psalmist in Psalm 2 said it like this, verses 1 through 6, Why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. The one enthroned in heaven, now this is interesting, this is the only time in scripture that I find this interesting, where you ever read that God laughs. This is the only time. It says, the one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger, terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. You can join all you want, and you can raise your puny little fist into the face of God if you like. But it, it, my granddaughter, Stella, is a couple years old. Her mama got her Krispy Kreme donuts today. Those are good. So she ate one, but she wanted another one. <laughs> and so my daughter was with one of the ladies in our church, Angie, and Angie said to Stella, no, you can't have that. So Stella, being a good child that she is, grabs the donut in her hand. You can't have that. She squashes it. I can't have it, you can't either. <laughs> and eats it. <laughs> and my daughter Corinne is not happy. And I hear her lecturing her daughter. I'm a grandfather, so I go to the rescue. It's only a donut. And I walk in, and Corinne's lecturing Stella as she's washing all of this stuff off her face and her hands. So Stella sees me and says, ah, lucky break. <laughs> and she reaches out to me, and so I give to her protection. I hold her, and I say, and what's the problem, Stella? She doesn't speak yet. Nothing, really. Everything's cool, Pops. So I say to her, Mama, what's up? Oh, she just did this, 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 and that. And I said, really? I said, isn't that terrible? <laughs> now, she's being defiant towards her mom. In reality, she's just a baby. What, what power does she really have? She can be defiant all she wants, but Mama still has control. Mama always does. Mama has control. And that's just on a human level. If you defy your earthly father or mom, that's one thing. But when you defy God himself, that's crazy. That's crazy. That is crazy. It really is. To defy the God of the universe. Hey, let's join forces and we'll go against him. And the Lord in heaven laughs. 
<laughs> Are you kidding me? You have no ability, ability to resist me. I've installed my king in Zion. Messiah will reign no matter what you do. And so with the Antichrist putting together a religious system, joining forces and developing a political system to resist the rule of God, the Lord in heaven scoffs and laughs and says, that's not going to take place. Jesus Christ is Lord. He shall rule and he shall reign. And that's what we see in Revelation chapter 17. Jesus Christ rules and he reigns.